All right. Uh, so everybody, I would like to introduce you to Zach, co-founder and uh, CTO is your position at Particle. Raise your hand if you're using a Particle Photon or Electron. I think it's only one guy here today. Where is it? Did you already leave? Yeah, I think I did. Sorry. Uh, we have several people using Photon, you'll see on the website later. But uh, he's the guy behind the tech that's running it. So be ready to ask a bunch of questions about uh, how we launched it, how we did it, and I'll hear Raise your hand if you were using a particle. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, he's here today. Um, anyways, he's done tons of cool stuff, some that worked, some that done, didn't. So like usual, it'll be like 15 minutes of him talking, and then you'll be able to ask him questions. Uh, if you have any questions while he's going, just raise your hand. Uh, this is his wonderful daughter, Persephone. I'm going to have her in back so you can hear her screaming. It's going to not bounce again. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, without further ado, please take it away. All right, thanks, Dave. So, hello, everyone. Zachary Crockett, CTO, founder of Pardon. Um, uh, I'm, I was thinking I would just sort of tell a, a really brief history of, uh, of the company so you can understand how we, how we got here, um, what it's like to start a company and build something like this that now you uh, know and, and can use. Um, to give just a little bit of background, what Particle does now, we are an Internet of Things platform. Lots of companies say that, but it means different stuff. We essentially we we provide the pipes for uh, if you want to have a hardware thing that connects to the Internet, uh, that is a low power microcontroller, and you want to be able to control that from other things on the Internet, and especially if you want to turn that into a product where you make a hundred of them, or a thousand of them, or ten thousand, or a million. Uh, we provide all the tools that you need to, to grow something that you make want to for yourself into a product that you can sell to millions of people if you like. So that's what that's what Particle's sort of mission in the world is today. But I was going to tell you a little bit about the, the history of the company. Um, so let's see. Back in 2012. Uh, Zach, my co-founder's name is also Zach, so it's potentially confusing. Around the office they call me Doc because I have a PhD in music. Uh, uh, in 2012, we launched a Kickstarter campaign for something called the Spark Summit. Uh, that campaign failed. Uh, it was a, uh, a retrofit for lights, like light sockets in your home. So you would plug this, you screw the socket into that, uh, the spark socket into your light bulb socket at home, you screw the light bulb into it. And now that bulb was dimmable over the internet. You could get up to uh, Twilio, Twitter, whatever you wanted, uh, and do things with it. Uh, so Kickstarter makes it hard to find the campaigns that did not do so well. So here's a TechCrunch article that went up around the time that we were running that campaign, but I couldn't find the campaign all the time. Uh, from there, when that campaign did not. did not go so well, we went uh, to China. So we got into an accelerator program uh, while that campaign was running for an accelerator called PAX. It's in Shenzhen, China. It's in the place where uh, a very large percentage of the electronic things in the world get made there. Um, you know, we could look around the room here and, and if we could see back in time where all these things came from, the circuit boards in a lot of the stuff in this room and in this building were made in that city in China or within you know, 100 miles of it. So factories you get further and further out of the city. Um, and there we learned a lot. We went there. Uh, it was my co-founder and me. We had uh, somebody back in the US working on marketing. And we had an intern who was going to do mechanical engineering because we were making uh, light bulb things. We needed like to do 3D models of but enclosures and stuff like that. Turns out we got there, we did the company a whole bunch of times. We, we figured out, well, uh, incandescent bulbs are way of the past, LEDs are the way of the future, so we're gonna do that. That also let us remove uh, some power supply issues in the product that made it hard to certify it. So we could use off-the-shelf power bricks and, and uh, like you have a computer and power an LED lamp. That was, that was going to be way easier and much more uh, straightforward for us to make that product. Um, we 
then eventually started thinking like, okay, well, how would we scale this business? If we wanted to make this really big, um, what, how can we get it into the market with our go-to market strategy? And um, we started thinking about uh, getting into lighting verticals. So instead of us making lamps, we wanted to make tech that we could sell to lamp makers. So there are companies that make you know, all kinds of lamps. We could sell them the tech and they could put it in products that get out the world much faster. And then we realized that the tech that we were thinking of selling to uh, lighting manufacturers actually was useful not just for lights, but for anything. If you want to take a thing that is not on the internet and put it, get it on the internet, that's what it was. And that was the uh, beginning, it was essentially pulling out the, uh, the inside, the guts of the Spark socket became the Spark core. The particle used to be called Spark. We rebranded last year. Spark something, spark something, yeah. uh, So in 2013, we ran this can Kickstarter campaign and raised about half a million dollars. Yeah. See, it was, uh, it was a very, a very exciting time. Um, we, we learned a lot. We had run the the Kickstarter campaign for the software before. We learned a lot. Learned a lot of how to do that. We were doing really, really, really well. Uh, we. Our goal was ten thousand dollars. We brought it back in like the first hour or two, um, and then uh, raised a whole lot more from that. Uh, came back to the U.S. We were living in Minneapolis at the time. We uh, eventually moved to San Francisco in 2014, and uh, over that time we were, we were building up uh, the tools that we gave people to make it easier and easier to make uh, Internet of Things products. And Getting, we were building a community that now numbers around 80,000 people. Um, it's, it's really great to go on our forums and see the conversation that happens. New people come in and ask questions. The community is really welcoming. Uh, uh, it's, it's very active and unlike a lot of other communities uh, for some of these products. You go on some other communities and you'll, you'll get kind of shot down if you ask a stupid question. It really shuts down uh, good conversation. The particle community is not, not like that at all. So even if you just want to learn about you know, electronic things in general, head over to community.particle.io. There's, there's a lot of great content there and, and fun people having a good conversation. Um, we learn constantly from that community um, a whole lot. In 2015, uh, no, 2014, we Upgraded. We essentially came up with the second version of what was the Spark Core. It had a lot of problems. We were having trouble working with TI, trying to um, uh, get their chip to go on the Spark Core and perform uh, the way that we wanted and the way that our community was demanding. Um, uh, a lot of things about Particle are very open source. We're getting lots of code contributions. That's right. Um, lots of code contributions from the community. We were really pushing. Uh, Texas Instruments firmware engineers uh, hard to improve that module. And uh, at a certain point, it became very clear that we needed to move on to something else. We had built enough traction with that community, with the Spark Pool, that uh, we were able to start having conversations with Broadcom. Uh, Broadcom is a, a big company that uh, only talks to you if you make thousands of things. You know, if you're, if you're making a project for yourself, if you're like, oh, but I have 10 friends who use it. I could even make 100 of them. You, you can't even get on the phone with them. Uh, so we had built up enough community where we had we could place a large enough order they were willing to, to talk to us. And that's how we came up with Photon. Photon we did not run on Kickstarter. Uh, we launched that on our own site. Uh, various things, reasons for that. We were learning a lot about how to do marketing. We didn't think we would bring in a whole new community. Kickstarter is really great for bringing in a new community who hadn't heard about you before. Um, uh, but with the Photon, it was essentially just the second generation of the Spark Core, and we were like, it's, it's better in all these ways, also it's half the price. Um, and you know, that got our existing community really excited. So we sold a lot of them just watching that on our own site, um, and lots of people are excited about using it today. Uh, we also started telling a more professional story, whereas we were sort of a, a maker of product with the Spark Core. With the photon 
and then two modules that we sell. So if you see a photon, there's a little uh, silver tin can on it. If you pull off just that tin can, we call that the P0. And if you want to make your own circuit board that's like the photon, but different in some way that fits your product, your project, you can do that. You can buy just the P0 from us. Um, that's pretty hard. There's a, there's a high barrier there. But we also have one called the P1, which is similar. You have to make your own circuit board, but it's got an antenna. Uh, it's already certified. You don't have to go through some certification hurdles if you want to sell a thing with the P0 and with the P1. You don't have to do the certification. So, started telling a more professional story, started making it so that other companies could use particles to put into their products. And, you know, somebody's got, they sell dishwashers, and they want to start making an internet-connected version of the dishwasher. They can talk to us, they can use photons, p zeros, p ones they can get this product out in the market really, really easily. We've got the tools they need to manage for a fleet of a million connected dishwashers. Um, then, last year, uh, so we were looking for new opportunities, and we came up with the idea for the electron. Cellu cellular, building a cellular connected thing. So Wi-Fi is great. Something sits stationary in, in your house, in Wi-Fi, uh, or it's sit sitting in the office. It's a thing that doesn't move and stays in Wi-Fi range. Wi-Fi is a great way to connect it. But we had lots of people who were trying to do something. They would ask us questions like, so if I want to connect uh, uh, the fence around my farm, my ranch, I want to get that on the internet. Can I like buy a whole bunch of photons, have Wi-Fi at my house, and then have them all by like, hopping the signal from one to another? And we were like, no, no, that's a really bad idea. You don't want to do it that way. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, what you have to do with your internet connection is you sell it. And so we were looking into that, trying to give people recommendations on how they could get their product off the ground. Um, but it was, it was just too hard, and so we set up to make it easier. Uh, we had to become a cell carrier. Cell carrier. You know, so we have SIM cards, particle SIM cards, that go into the electron. Um, we had to do a lot of certification. Uh, uh, all, all the world's governments and big telecommunication companies don't want to put any random person just sending uh, cellular radio waves all over the place. There's a lot of certification hurdles. Hard and very expensive, so people who might think like, "Oh, I want to, I want to make something to connect to a ranch that's to the internet. I want to do it cellular because that's the right way to do it." And then they start looking into it and start feeling like, "Oh my gosh, there's so much paperwork. I have to do this paperwork in so many countries, and it's so expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars." So they wouldn't even do it. So we built the electron to be to cross all those, yeah, cover all those barriers. So that if someone so you take the product, all they have to do is buy the electron, put it in the product, wire it up just like you guys are, and there you go. It works, and it works well enough to actually be put into a product. Uh, that we spent, uh, I have a team of, the company is about 30 people, it's about half engineers and half, half business people. Uh, uh, you can imagine what people do, well, the business side, there's a lot that goes into so these certification work. We also have a team on the ground in China to manufacture things. Yeah, get those things uh, delivered to uh, logistics uh, providers and distribution centers around the world. People you know, place orders uh, on our website, or they go to Mauser, or they go to uh, you know, it and they want to buy some of our things. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of work that goes into getting all these materials to, into. We don't think about it. Just we, we click the buy button and it shows up. Um, and then, as far as the engineers on the team, there are there are a lot of cloud services that we have that the devices connect to. That uh, when people want to hit our API, those uh, those API endpoints depend on compiling on the back end because you don't want to make people run their own compiler for the for particle products. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of cloud services. Those need to be work possibly. Well, for tools, you know, you know, the online web ID, the download, there's all kinds of things that people are uh, working on and building and improving. And hardware engineers to, to make the circuit. There's hardware, hardware engineers to, to write the code that uh, 
sits underneath all the code that, that our customers write that, that you have to write. Uh, okay, that's basically the story of, of how we got here. I wanted to show some pictures of the place in, in China where we were. So, um, the tax office was in a neighborhood in Shenzhen called Huachang Bay. It's, uh, it's the biggest electronics market in the world. Um, it's, it's really uh, quite a sight to be built. You have skyscrapers and skyscrapers full of uh, just people selling uh, everything from LEDs to timer chips to capacitors to billboards for capacitors. You're just like walking around the street, there's a billboard and it's like, buy our capacitors, they're great. You don't, that's not something you see. You don't walk down the street for service. So a billboard for Skyscrapers and skyscrapers, forty-story skyscrapers. Every floor is some is just wall-to-wall -wall, tiny vendors selling electronics. And the way you go, if you want to make a product like the photon, and we have a bunch of computers and sensors and capacitors and other chips and a power management module and these things to talk to them and find, figure out like because if you buy something online on DigiKey or something, that's the high retail. Price that you're going to pay if you want. If you want to make 10,000 of something, you want that, you know, 50 cent chip to actually be maybe 8 cents. Because the more of them you buy, the cheaper, the, the more that that price difference uh, becomes really important. Maybe <coughs> thousands or millions. Uh, so I just wanted to, it was really eye opening for me. <laughs> That's about it. That's basically the story of, of how how we got here. Uh, and uh, I'd love to hear questions. What's it? So like over the next couple of months, so it's like my hardware is going to go. As opposed to software. Yeah. Um, so uh, it is it's harder. It's like hardware is hard. Uh, uh, starting a company that involves hardware means, well, okay, a, a typical San Francisco startup that is just software, that's making an app or a website. Um, you know, two friends in a garage, uh, not paying themselves anything, can work for uh, months in their spare time and make something pretty significant if they, if they put their, their time and energy into it. Uh, you can do that with basically no money and just just the time and effort that you put into it. With hardware, that's not true. Because if you want to actually make something, get it into people's hands, you have to buy it first. You have to buy the components, and then you have to put in the time to, to make it. You have to have solder guys. You have to buy, buy the solder. You have to buy the wires. You have to buy your, uh, your, your, your power supplies and, and other things that uh, let you actually do a good job making it. Or you have to pay somebody else to do it. You know. So uh, one of the big differences is that it's it's capital intensive. You have to pay money up front before you can actually make a hardware thing. Especially if you're trying to do it at any scale, right? Make a bunch of them and get them into people's hands. You have to pay a lot of money up front before anybody. Uh, so that's that, that would be one of the, the biggest differences. Uh, that used to mean basically that small. You know, people, people like me couldn't start hardware companies. It was basically impossible. Kickstarter has made that much, much more possible. Because the thing that Kickstarter lets you do is say, here's my idea. I've done all of the free, the, the work I can do for free. I've put this, you know, or, or for cheap. I've made like one prototype. I haven't spent a ton of money. Um, you know, show people, like, hey, I have an idea. I've put a lot of thought into this. You can trust me. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to actually do it. Um, so, back my project. And people will give you the money before you had to go out and buy that stuff. So, uh, and in 2012, when we were making this from Sophie, Kickstarter was in it. That was, it was, it was very new, it was very disruptive. This was a brand new thing. All these new hardware companies were, were getting started because now there was a way to do it. That's, that's the biggest, biggest difference. Ah, 
Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's cheaper, it's a lot cheaper. Photon um, is $20, Arduino plus a Wi Fi shield, I think it's at like $120, something like that. Down to but, 80. It's down to 80. For just the shield. No, you can usually get both. Oh, you can get both? Okay, cool. So, okay, so 20%. <coughs> okay. Uh, it is a more powerful processor, it's got more memory in it. That's all talking about specifically the hardware. Um, that's actually not where the core value is. So the two hardware solutions, fine, they do roughly the same thing. But if you take an Arduino shield and a uh, Wi-Fi shield, and you, you get it, uh, you, you connect it to Wi-Fi, what then? If you want to like actually do something with it that is connected to the internet, if you want that sensor to have that uh, dumping data into a database, It's out in the field somewhere and you're not here. These are all things that you would have to build yourself. Uh, that doesn't come with the box, out of the box. Um, Photon, you plug it in, there's an app that makes it really easy to set up. You have tons of tools that make it easy to, to program. So you can go to a web page and program. If you prefer working just in your terminal, you can load an GitHub repo, you can program a repo with that one. You can download an IDE and work that way. Uh, Android SDK and iOS SDK and Windows SDK. If you want to make apps, we make it super simple to make apps that talk to your devices. Uh, we give you a way to, uh, uh, well, over the air firmware updates are huge. Uh, the ability to, to do that remotely. Because otherwise, you have to, if you have something that's actually kind of far away, it's not where you are right now, uh, you have to actually get in your car, go you know, out to where the thing is, hook in a wire from left. Reprogram it. Okay, we do. Uh, with the photon, uh, you can just be sitting at your desk. You can think of uh, a fix for that bug you were seeing last night. You go to the website, hit flash, and now wherever the thing is in the world, it's running your code. Uh, yeah. The the difference is really in all the all the tools that we put out there. How easy we make the experience, both of prototyping and of making something uh, at production scale. So. If you're making something production scale, to the components that are on a Arduino and Wi-Fi shield don't. I was talking about that, like costing down. Uh, if you want the components to all be as cheap as possible, uh, while still meeting your your standards and your tolerances, if you're going to make a whole bunch of them. Uh, if you start with an Arduino and Wi-Fi shield, you will throw the components away. The photon is designed to be using the components that you will use. Smooth transition from prototype to production. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Um, so you spoke about how working on some like tools for developers. What apart from that, what's the challenge for people coming in right now? Apart from just buying the tools for developers. Sure. Sure. Um, <laughs> the, that's the kind of <laughs> um, one of the big uh, things that we're working on right now, you, you can expect to see, if you come to this URL in the month, uh, it will look very different. Uh, so we're working on a big relaunch that's not just a website look, but it's uh, the underlying pricing structure. Uh, when a big company wants to deploy a large so we're, we have, we're continuing the development of that, that transition from a good local team to a really great professional tool um, We've really done a good job in the maker side, and we've done a pretty good job. There are products out there in the world that, that use our systems, but uh, there are more things we need. There's a bigger gap here, so a lot of the things we're doing are improving tools for large companies, so big companies that uh, thank you. You're a little stuck, can I, can I trust you with my data? Can I, can I trust that some of your, you know, this open source stuff you're doing is going to be uh, industrial grade and enterprise quality? So, uh, building the tools and that, that get them that confidence is the big direction. Um, yeah, so, 
so it works. The experience of using it, if you've been using it for fun, you have to put it on the phone, you have to do a little white by setup. And then you just use our other tool, the web ID repo. The same code that you write for the protocol in the web ID, if you have an electron on your account, you just switch, say, no, don't put it on the code, put it on my electron. And the same code compiles for a totally different part. Uh, so we've abstracted that. Um, as far as sort of how the, the, the signal path, how, how the flow works, if an electron, say, uh, has a sensor connected to it, you'd write your, your Arduino type code, you know, your setup and which one so to read that sensor. And then when you want to, say, uh, dump that sensor data into the device, you'd write one line of code that says particle.publish temp. And then the, the variable pulls the, the current temperature. That will use the SIM card that's there as the credentials to talk to a cell tower uh, and send, the, send that data over the internet to the, the cell tower. The cell tower will then route it <laughs> to the uh, cellular infrastructure and eventually get it on the, the global internet. It will eventually make its way back to our servers. If you set up uh, a web hook on our server, Basically, you can, maybe we'll wrap this up and if somebody, uh, if, if you're interested, I think I've got, I have electrons in my bag, I'm not sure they're working, they might be one of the debug ones that I've been working on, um, but uh, I can show you. It's, but it's basically, uh, not instantaneous, but there's a very small gap, yeah, like, you know, I could hit a button on my phone and the LED turns on the electron. Boom, boom. Oh, it's pretty cool.